Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great event on tap for you, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for one of our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use the question and answer tab there on your interface and submit your questions. And we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. We also have a very interactive chat feature that uh, one of our uh, speakers, Helen Beal, has already availed herself of. And so I do encourage the audience to chat us up as much as you want. You can send us your questions, comments, suggestions, whatever. We do encourage it. We might even ch chat you back. Also, uh, a couple of polling questions throughout today's webinar. We'll have two of them, so please be on the lookout for that. And we also have a couple things uh, for you guys to take away with you. One of them is uh, an ebook download that's right there in the public chat. It's called The Evolution of the Release Manager, and it is available for you to download. And uh, we also have in the handout section, we do have a copy of today's slides, so in case you are asking. And then uh, finally, at the end of today's webinar, uh, we are doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. Okay, with that, I think I've gone over all of the housekeeping items. So let's get right on into today's webinar, which is Simplify Complexity with Value Stream Management. Our speakers today are Jeffrey Kies, who is the VP of Product Marketing Strategy at Plutora. Helen Beal, who is the Chief Ambassador at the DevOps Institute and a DevOps coach. And Tony Monjovi, who is the AVP of Release Management over at Health First. Uh, Tony, Jeff, Helen, thank you all three of you for being here. I am very excited about today's conversations. And uh, Helen, I know you're going to be kicking things off. So I'm going to put myself on mute, take myself off camera, and I'll see you guys on the backside. See you a little bit later. Thank you, Charlene. Uh, and hello, audience. Uh, and some holidays coming through. We call them holidays in the UK rather than vacations. Um, today, we are talking about how to manage dependencies, how to create deployment plans, and how to manage by exception, and ultimately, how to perfectly orchestrate your complex deployments that I'm sure you have. So, Let's start by talking about dependencies. So we have this wonderful phrase in DevOps where we talk about breaking dependencies, not managing them, which is a, a beautiful idea. But I think the sad fact is, or the true fact is, that most organizations have lots of dependencies um, because that's the way they were built. And it's not possible to remove them overnight, even if people had the desire and direction to do so. So we have all these different sorts of dependencies. So upstream, downstream, and cross-valley stream. So, Tony, maybe you could kick us off by giving us an example of an upstream dependency that you've come across in your world. Yeah, so for, you know, we have a lot of legacy applications. Um, you know, our, our company is not that old. Our company is only about 28 years old, but we have a lot of applications that have been around for that long. We've got a lot of new applications, and the new ones are being built on, uh, CI CD pipelines, which is really great, but the problem is that they need data from the upstream systems. They interface with the upstream system. So it, it's not 100% independent. Um, so we often have member facing apps. So we're an insurance company, right? So we've got payment systems and, and other types of systems for our members to interface with us, you know, their web apps or their mobile apps. Those systems depend on other back end components. Uh, you know, the mobile app, as an example, there's some intelligence built into it that will turn off certain tabs on the app if a backend service is not available. But that creates a problem for the member experience. So as an example, if I'm if I'm wanting to get on there and, and pay my premium and the payments tab is missing, uh, then it's it's not a good experience and it's frustrating, right? We do that to try to eliminate problems, but you know, the fact is if if it's not there, you're a little confused by it, right? And that's because of the downstream impacts. 
because uh, things are are so tightly coupled. That's just one example. There's a lot of other ones that that are not so obvious where uh, there's impacts in. So one application could be built in a totally automated fashion, but if it's not tested along with the upstream dependencies, you're really rolling the dice when you deliver it to production if it's actually going to work, right? I mean, you know, the changes may work, but you may not know that that there's some dependent piece that's broken or some other interface that wasn't updated because you haven't tested them together. And that's stuff that we're actually working on with some of the tools that we use to try to, to um, orchestrate those things together so that, that we do manage those dependencies. So upstream, downstream, third party, what about cross value stream or any of those sort of across multiple value streams that you described or is that something different? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it, you know, in the example I used, if you think about what we do, we're an insurance company, right? So we have claims. Everybody knows. Everybody has health insurance, right? You've submitted claims. But then you have a, an enrollment and billing piece that's sort of part of the same company, but that all feeds in. So once you get somebody enrolled, now they can do claims, right? So that data has to feed through to the claim system or they need to make payments. That data needs to feed through to the, the group that does, that does payments or... Um, uh, you know, the correspondence, anybody that's had any experience with an insurance company, you get a lot of mail, like paper mail. That's just regulatory stuff that all com insurance companies have to deal with. But those are really critical, right? If you're, if, if you don't have your ID card, you can't go to your doctor or you can't mm -hmm. go to your pharmacy and use your benefits. And if those systems aren't talking to each other, now suddenly we have a big disconnect and, and, and potentially a big problem, right? If, if somebody can't use their benefits, that could be a, a significant health issue. So they're, they are important. So we have all these different systems, lots of people crossing over these different systems. Jeff, tell us about what we're looking at here on the right of this screen. Well, you know, so, hey, I'm a vendor. We, we help with this problem because we're a value stream management platform. So we take data and visualize it, help you visualize mm -hmm. it uh, of what's happening in the software factory. So what you're looking at the right is our system impact matrix and in essence, you're seeing along the left side a series of, of releases um, from the various value streams. And on the top, you're seeing the uh, a, a mix of the different applications or systems that are matching. And inside, you're seeing, well, where do those line up and what what's happening across these? And there's various kinds of dependencies that you're going to see in there. You're going to see uh, direct code impact, meaning, hey, uh, this release is actually making changes to these components, and I know that there's an impact there, and so uh, I've got to do something with that dependency. There might also be where I know that I'm changing an upstream system, and all the downstreams have, in essence, a, a regression dependency, meaning I've got to <clears throat> make sure it didn't break me. <laughs> it, it didn't have any uh, uh, big code impact, but... I still want to make sure that, you know, the Hippocratic Oath, I haven't blown anything up. So you'll see those in yellow. So the green are the code, the yellow are the um, regression. Now, there's some other kinds of dependencies that we can track in there. But ultimately, what you're, you know, if you're managing risk, you're looking at the overall, how many um, impacts are there? Um, how many changes and, and how many releases are there changing for a particular application? Because that's usually a hot spot for... Uh, 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 looking for risk. And, and if you're managing by exception, that number of user stories that are, are changing a particular component is interesting because where I've got a high number, hmm, generally that's where I should look for problems. And maybe look for resolutions as well, how to break those famous dependencies. But Tony, tell us about how you capture these and use them and where you can get that data from. Yeah, so we... We use, we're agile pretty much a, across the board in, in everything we do. So all of our work is managed in a tool um, by Agility, Agility AI, which is formerly version one, but it's it's Epic's feature stories, right? It's, it's your typical agile work. So the work is all there, right? That's great. Everybody knows what they're doing, but it's hard to see across it. But in those tools, and most, most agile tools give you some ability of doing upstream and downstream management where you can say my story or my feature has upstream or downstream dependencies. And we use that. We've used that for many years. Within Plotora, the way that that translates for us is I can see the other releases that those dependencies are relating to. So when I look at our release, we do typically a release. We do a pretty big release every month. We have about 80 applications participating in that release. 
So what's important to me from a release management perspective is to know where the touch points are. So for instance, if one application is maybe at risk because they're having some challenges with defects or timeliness, and maybe they can't make the release, if they're going to move out, I just, I want to know anybody that they're impacting or vice versa. And so the impact matrix that Jeff has shown here works really well for us. So it just organically gathers that data from the features and stories and gives us the visual so I can see which ones have direct code impact to, to Jeff's point or which ones have an, an upstream or downstream dependency. And that allows us to, act, to ask the right questions. So manage by exception. And the worst case example is, you know, application A can't make the release because they've got some defects that they're working on that, that just can't go to production. <clears throat> Is there anybody that needs to be aware of that, right? So we don't want other guys that maybe are upstream, downstream from them to go to production if that application doesn't, because then what happens? You have a significant impact in production and now you have a major incident and you don't want to deal with that, right? And we've had that happen in the past. And now we're a lot better at that because we can see those things and, and we have awareness. And why is it that you can only see that information or visualize those dependencies in Plutora? Um, it's not that you can only see them there, but it's it's that you can see them at a higher level, right? You can see them kind of the 50,000 foot level, you know, if you look at it from that perspective, right? Um, if I know I'm working on something, I can see who I'm dependent on and the person can see that I'm dependent on them. But the rest of the organization, so the other 78 applications that are involved in the release have no visibility. And the release managers on, on my team are dealing with 80 applications in the release, it's impossible to, to look at the, literally in our November release, we have a thousand one hundred and some odd stories that are in the release. It's impossible to look at all those and to see that. And so you, you need some kind of tools to give you the ability. And it's made our life a lot easier to be able to have the visualization. Yeah, and just a note on that too, Helen. It's it's interesting as we as as I look across our customers, Health First is in a great starting position where a lot of this data is already available in a single instance of a uh, of a planning tool. Many many of our customers don't have that. You know, they're heavily reliant on other tools like Jira, and and so they've got various teams and various repositories where the planning data has ended up being. Uh, in essence, very siloed into these different instances. And so there's no common repository, what are all the applications or what are all the releases? And so Plutora ends up being uh, aggregating across that. And even where they do exist, um, it, you know, there's still different methodologies. Things mean different things. And so needing something to normalize that um, language across. And to flush out, you know, you, Ellen, I think <clears throat> you used it earlier, or, or maybe Jeff, the, um, the exceptions, right? What are the things we want to look at? Right. When, when you're dealing with 1100 some odd user stories, I don't need to look at all of them. I need to look at the ones that are in trouble. And how mm -hmm. do I know which ones are in trouble? You know, I, I can tell by the state and the timeline and where we are relative to our release, right? The closer you get to the release, anything that's not accepted by the product owner becomes a risk. We are going to come back to managing by exception in some detail later. And I think Jeff has nicely introduced us to this next part of the topic around dependency mapping. I had a, a LinkedIn conversation with a practitioner this morning for the, from an airline in the Middle East who was bemoaning the fact that all his different teams had different capabilities, were practicing different frameworks and had different tool chains. And I sympathized with him and said that is the way out there. And we do see it as a problem, but I think it's only natural, actually. And if we're trying to give teams the autonomy to find their own way and travel their own journeys as they transition towards DevOps, that's what happens. But Jeff, tell us a little bit more about what we're seeing here in terms of the different methodologies, different tool sets. Well, and uh, so what we're seeing here is a, a set of various teams that practice, you know, their own methodology. We, as teams and companies move from being more project oriented to product oriented, cross functional teams that are uh, becoming more and more autonomous, they're on their own journey of evolution, which means every team's going to be practicing at the speed that makes the most sense to them with the right methodology for their technologies and, and current level of maturity. So you might have some teams that are very waterfallish. That's okay. Uh, some of the uh, mainframe teams, for example, maybe it just makes sense given the amount of people and the amount of current investment into that world to stay in that world because of managing risk and the rest of it. 
uh, other teams may not have the level of risk and uh, capabilities and and so forth. And, and maybe they've got more advanced and so they can accelerate faster uh, adopting newer, newer practices. There ought to be a, a way to manage across this without having to slow everybody down to a common speed. And there is. And that's where mapping these different dependencies across the teams independently of their methodology or independently of their tool set um, can help. Um, you know, for example, uh, some teams that are on a, a Microsoft stack, for example, work better if you're using the uh, Microsoft set of tools. Some teams that are, um, <clears throat> you know, you can kind of run through it. And, and there's always this desire to standardize or normalize and say, we're going to have one team, you know, one tool to rule all teams. And it's just, it's not real. Um, especially as teams are looking for continuous improvement, they need to be able to make localized micro improvements on their platform. So what this shows then is a way that we can look across and gather dependencies across the teams independently of their tools, technologies, methodology, and wherever they are on this uh, maturity curve. And this ought to be the, the, the goal of enablement rather than uh, just a nightmare. So in a perfect world, everyone will be behaving themselves and doing what they set out to do and following all of the rules and the calendars. But I'm telling you, that doesn't always happen. Um, what happens if someone needs to delay their release? And, and why would somebody need to delay their release? Um, I'll answer the second part first. The, the most common reason somebody needs to delay their release is they're just not ready, right? So there's there's a critical piece of what's being delivered that's that's having challenges or the business owner isn't willing to sign off on it in a certain state because it doesn't you know, satisfy the need, or maybe because there's a real defect, like it's it's allowing some private information to be seen or you know whatever. But it's typically going to be a defect, right? And it's a defect that that we're not willing to sign off on. Sometimes it could be because of a third party. You know, we we have a lot of dependency on on the state because sometimes there are, are laws and things that go into effect that we have to support. And there have been times where the state's not ready. And so we have to delay because the supporting component's not ready. Um, so what, what do you do? And, and the first thing you need to do is figure out what the dependencies are, right? So back to the previous slide, once we know what the dependencies are, then we can slide all that stuff and we can, we can slide it to somewhere that makes sense. So that's the next question is how do you know what, what's a good time, which Helen kind of, is the same answer as the previous question that you asked on how do we know if we've got something urgent and we need to do it right when are we going to do it so th this is a this is a great picture right so so imagine and everybody on this call i'm sure can imagine this something's broken in production you have a major issue you need to fix it now um but now at the same time imagine that you have uh, and i'll back go back to my October release a couple of weeks ago, 676 discrete activities that are being done during a three day period. And we have a major incident in production that we need to figure out how to fix. So what's the best time to do that? You know, you, you can't just say, well, it's production, fix it. I mean, you want to say that, but you have to be mindful of, am I gonna impact anything else? So now you need to be able to figure out what that everything else is. And the fact is that most companies, unfortunately, don't have everything automated where, you know, like the big guys, like the Amazons and the Facebooks of the world that, that are fully, um, you know, DevOps, most companies aren't like that. So you need to figure out what you can do. And you have a lot of manual activities and most people use spreadsheets. We went away from spreadsheets about two years ago because it's, you know, take our example, we've got 80 applications. It's impossible for somebody to look across 80 applications and see what's going on at any point in time. But if it's data, I can do a search and I can figure out, and that's how we do it, right? We manage by exception. So when somebody came to me two weeks ago with a major incident and said, we, we need to do it in the next two days, I was able to look and say, okay, here we have, we have an hour and a half window from you know, 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. on Saturday afternoon. Can we do that? Yep, no problem. Okay, let's do it. And now we know we're doing it at a safe time. So we're managing by exception where we're we're doing it at a time that we know there's not an impact or if there is something else going on, we know what they are and we know that we can safely do it. Fabulous, let's have our first poll for today. So I'm gonna start that off and that should be now running. Um, you kept on saying the word safe then, Tony, and I think we often think of 
gatekeepers and we often think of traditional release managers as a, as a gatekeeper and same with cab we think of them being blockers often but you're talking about safety so who are we trying to protect in this scenario everybody we're trying to protect you from you know your your release going in safely right your i'll try to use a different word your release going in successfully mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to protect somebody else from the emergency thing coming in pulling the rug out from underneath them on this planned activity that they've had for how who knows how long that's maybe a critical business functionality that you're delivering and so you don't want to to upset that because we didn't take the time to figure out uh, can these two things coexist so the, the first thing you want to know is what's happening the second thing is now you can do the analysis and say can these two things coexist which is always interesting because usually it's it's a handful of people that know where the conflicts are and not everybody knows what they are so it's always safer to pick a time that there's nothing else going on because then you won't step on each other's feet and, and helen i'll give you a, a real live case in point friday afternoon we had our we do monthly patching and we're, we're pretty aggressive on getting any kind of security related patching into production quickly and we had one set of patching for um, a database platform and I got wind on Friday afternoon from some of our call center teams that there was going to be a big impact. Now, our call center during uh, the open enrollment period that we're in now is highly critical, right? That's where, that's our connection to our member <clears throat> population. So I, I had to stop the change. And the person that was running it said, well, why are you doing that? There's no impact. And I said, well, these, these folks over here are telling me there is. And then a, a fourth person came to me and said, yeah, there is. The whole call center will go down if we let this change go. So we stopped it and we averted the disaster. But that was a case of the person that was the technical lead on it really didn't understand one particular piece of it, that there was an impact. Um, so, yeah, you just need to be careful. And, and the best way to do it is to know what's happening. Yeah. And it can be unplanned work, for instance, can't it? It can be scope creep, and there's lots of reasons why people want emergency changes. Yep. Let's have a look at this poll. So it's still open at the moment. The question we've asked you is how often does your team need to make changes when you're in your deployment window? So we've got A, we make changes during the release cycle often, but we don't need them approved. That's, I think, probably our... Well, it's not actually our ideal answer. Our ideal answer is probably F. We'll come back to that in a second. Then we've got B, all the time, and our release managers approve them or not. C, sometimes, and the release managers approve them or not. D, never. E, never, we don't have deployment windows. And F, never, we don't have deployment windows because we are fully autonomous and automated and can release on demand. So that's our <laughs> kind of perfect scenario. And we do have 13% of respondents answering that. But we have um, also 13% on that other option A, we make changes during the release cycle often, but we don't need them approved. But most people are in either nearly 40% in either getting release managers to approve things all the time or getting release managers to approve things sometimes. Jeff, was that the kind of spread of answers that you were anticipating for that question? You know, uh, a lot of times, uh, somewhat, yes. Um, and it's a little bit uh, uh, optimistic because it assumes that the release managers actually can see everything that's going on, or there's a belief that um, their changes won't impact anyone. Um, I, you know, there's there's times when you just can't. There was uh, one of our customers uh, a while back when Hurricane Katrina came out uh, or was happening, and there was all these downtimes in. Uh, uh, in the area, they were struggling. And so software teams were, you know, on their normal path. And what happens, we had a release management team that said, look, FEMA had called and said, please don't make any more changes to any systems until we can stabilize what we've got. Um, we don't want any more of these systems going down because they were in charge of a public system. So it wasn't about even the team's ability to uh, do what they thought was, you know, would be successful. It was about a, an external force saying, look, we got to block everything right now. You know, hold the hold the forts. But um, yeah, the the distribution is that uh, uh, most people believe that they can get there, but there's still problems. There's still incidences that happen. There's still uh, uh, catastrophes that go on, and we'd like to do better at improving it um, through managing these dependencies and through having the visibility of what's going on. 
Let's talk about another method of doing that then. Let's talk about deployment plans. So, Tony, who needs to have a deployment plan? Everybody. <laughs> um, so this is what I was this is what I was referring to earlier Helen though we uh, you know in all serious, seriousness right our, our our change process and and most change processes will require some sense of um documenting what you're doing you know to to keep it track from a governance perspective and from an audit perspective uh, and a lot of folks use spreadsheets and you know that's great um but you can't you can't really read them very easily if you have many of them um, mm -hmm. So we've taken to do a little bit of a different process, which is using something that Hotora gives us, which is deployment plans, which is really just think about it as as um, a web based version of, of a project management tool that gives you a way to, to visually see stuff. Right. It's just data now. Everything that you're doing is data. So now you can search them. So a couple months ago when I had a similar problem where Amazon came to us and said, hey, by the way, on on Thursday, your um, your region's going to be rebooted, and you're going to have you know two hours of downtime or whatever it was. We found out last minute, and we had a pretty significant release going that weekend. So I needed to know what was happening during that time. I was able to to do a very quick search using Tableau and find everything that was happening during that period and move things around a little bit. You know, I could I found out of the hundreds of things that were going on, the six things that were happening during that window, and I could move them. And then there was no impact. So they these teams make their deployment plans in Pretoria, and then you get to look at all the data. But how do you know that what they've put in the system is right? How can you trust that data? Um, so, yeah, there's, I guess, a twofold answer to that. So part of part of a process that we have is we do have a kind of a maker checker. So we have an author and we have an approver. And that's just our process that we've we've set up internally. So we don't allow somebody to have both roles. So it's usually the technical leads that are the approvals, approvers and the development folks that are the people that are creating the plans, they're the authors. So there's a check right there where, where somebody at a little bit of more of a lead level is reviewing the plan for accuracy. Um, that's the first thing. And it, to some extent, we have to trust that they're doing it. We trust that they've Te they've tested their plan in their in the lower environment. So there's a little bit of trust in the process, but there's also a check and balance to make sure that somebody that's a little bit more senior is approving that, yeah, this is accurate. And how can you know that people aren't rubber stamping? You can't. I mean, that's hard. That's, that's really hard to do, to, to know that they're not rubber stamping. That's why one of the reasons we have a <laughs> separation of duties is to try to eliminate that. If I'm approving my own plan, it's unlikely I'm actually going to do a review, right? I'm I'm confident in what I did, and I'm just going to prove it and move it through the process. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you, that's a definite risk, Helen, and there's it's it's a hard one to deal with. But the only way you can do that is as you automate, and that's the more and more we automate, then the less of that issue we have because there's less things that are manual steps that you have to worry about. And there's a, an, an add-on to that too, Helen, which is. You know, with the deployment plans, as people approve, you can actually see, you know, did they rubber stamp it? Were there problems? You can kind of go back because you have an audit trail of everything that happened. Yep. And the other audit trail <laughs> we have, Helen, is we, and, and again, it's our internal process, but we don't allow things to be added after it's approved. So if you want to add things on the fly during the release, you need the release manager to work with you. And then once we identify that, we raise that as as an issue that we can kind of kind of come back to in our retros when we, we do retros after every release and we come back and say, well, okay, what happened? You know, we had X number of things that were that were missed and were had had to be added during the release. How do we fix that? How do we improve that process next time? And there's a couple of things you said. You talked about automating and you just talked about retrospective improvement, which is like all quite exciting, I imagine, for teams, but we've also talked about people being not allowed to do this and allowed to do that and things and the risk of rubber stamping. So I'm wondering how much resistance you've met from the teams and individuals in adopting this, but also on the other side of that, what you've experienced in terms of people learning and progressing as they transition towards more of a value stream oriented environment. Um, we we did experience a little bit of resistance initially because it's changing the culture, right? When you move from something like spreadsheets to a, a little bit more of an, um, uh, an online kind of system, um, it's different, right? It, people are used to doing things a certain way. Spreadsheets seem easier because it's, you know, hey, I've got my own spreadsheet. I can do it real quickly. But, you know, 
there's five copies floating around and how do you know which one is the right? So the versioning is very important. And that was one of the things that drove us to, to going down this route. And so people adopted that pretty easy because they saw the, they saw the value. Uh, the, and the other side of that is mm -hmm. when you no longer have it in spreadsheets, we've got a dashboard that rolls up 80 applications and 696 discrete activities into one really simple dashboard that we can see where we are and what's on track and what's late. Uh, so, a little resistance initially, but over time, uh, people start to see the value of, of doing that. Uh, the rubber stamping, you know, that, that, that's another another thing. But as far as the resistance to change, um, I think they understand the value of of getting it right. And so when we do our retros, um, they do try to learn and try to improve. And, and a lot of times it's internal processes. You know, sometimes it might be that a team doesn't have a very good um, code management process or versioning process. And that's the reason that something was missed. And sometimes there's other reasons that aren't so obvious, but um, it's all in the spirit of, of getting faster. I think rubber stamping is a cultural problem as well, because it's all about accountability and purpose and being engaged at work and wanting all the right things. But yeah, and sometimes rubber stamping, and, and this is unfortunately, this is human nature, but sometimes when things are perceived to be really important, like a production issue, um, you try to go really fast and you kind of forget the basic principles of what you would do in a normal situation. Yeah. And um, you it's forget- the anxiety on the cognitive load. It's like you yeah. rush it through and you miss things. Yeah. So master deployment plans, child deployment plans, deployment plans, release plans. Um, Jeff, help us through this. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on here? Yeah. You bet. Well, first of all, separate out two different worlds. There's the process of what we call releases implator, which is the entirety of the process. It is the uh, managing the scope, the stages, the making sure that scope items are included in time. And then there's deployment and deployment plans, which is about transition, the go live event, and all the series of finely orchestrated activities that have to happen have to happen in a precise sequence and timing in order for it to go live because, um, you know, that's just what's needed. Um, master deployment plans are containers. So they give you the ability to take multiple uh, uh, plans that are owned by the individual teams and roll them up and manage them as such. And so they go from a draft state to an approval state to, hey, we're in execution. And then, uh, then it's all done. Um, in that journey, then you can kind of see where it is at. Here's the key is master deployment plans give each team the ability to manage their own plan. It's their plan. They're the ones putting it together. And, and then, you know, if there is an approval process, well, great. It, the team can create their plan and then submit it and say, this is what we're planning to do. Here's the amount of time it's going to take. Here's uh, the effort. It, it, it Does it matter how much is automated or not? No. Uh, put in as much as you can uh, the automated bits. In fact, you can use Plutora to kick the automated bits. You can just wire it up and you're good to go. Um, and so then what the, the individual teams were able to do is to present that all back and to make sure that there's a uh, someone to puppeteer it from the high level so that teams aren't going to conflict and that things will happen in the right way. If two teams are trying to change the same resource, well, that's where you need a little help because you, you may not know. We've got a question from Sharif in the audience. Sharif has asked, how does value stream management help small self-contained changes being pushed by agile product teams multiple times a day or a week? Most of the releases are done through automated CI CD pipelines. Well, first of all, I'd say that Sharif sounds that, that they're in a fairly advanced capability state, which is um, some organizations have, but it's not. Uh, often uniform across an organization and they may still have dependencies. In this particular webinar, we're focusing really on the enterprise complexity around interdependencies for release managers. Um, but that use case is a little bit more towards the flow metrics and optimization of cycle time. In my mind, that's where the real power of FBSM comes in. But Jeff, what, how would you respond to that question as well? Well, and there's more to it. Uh, the, the enterprise nature of the problem is different. Um, as the dependencies increase, the complexity increase exponentially. Um, and the challenges you face are more, especially as you add uh, regulatory compliance and the rest of it into the mix. Um, it just gets harder. Um, but VSM itself will help by 
adding a governance layer or at least a transparency layer that is both automated and, um, you know, basically it happens transparently. So you can actually see that these changes are happening. Um, the biggest challenge uh, teams face is they don't know um, what one team is doing versus another. And you end up playing Russian roulette um, on, you know, gosh, hope nobody else is changing this. As the frequency of deployments go up, so long as the, the deployments are truly um, without any dependencies, okay, you know, you're pushing containers out. But what if, um, you know, the operations teams need, need to make, you know, structural changes to the uh, physical environment? How will you know? How will you know if there's external factors, you know, the a la Katrina state or, um, you know, heaven forbid, there's some other uh, external factor like uh, please don't change things because there's uh, an open enrollment going on. I, I may have heard stories like that before or something else big where you, you really want to lock things down. Um, value stream management gives you that overall um, visibility across what's happening, regardless if you're using it as a governance layer or just purely as a visibility layer. That uh, control tower helps you see and manage what's happening. So Jeff, again, it's a great overview. Thank you prior to that question about deployment plans and things. Tony, would you like to talk us through the sort of day-to-day -day experience of using deployment plans and searching and seeing trends and such things? Yeah, the visibility is is huge. I, I can cannot say enough about it. Right. So, you know, again, in our in our organization, we do we do big releases. We for our apps that are are automated, like our mobile app, for instance, we do weekly releases and they kind of go pretty self-contained, but most of our other apps have very high dependencies. And we do a release of 80 applications in a three-day period every month. Um, <clears throat> and, and there's a lot going on. So I, I need to know who's who's on track and who's not, and who's got issues and who doesn't have issues. And the data, the data helps. So when you have all these deployment plans and everybody has a deployment plan, and we can roll it up into a dashboard, something like you've got here. It's very easy to see, and again, managed by exception. If everybody's on track, I'm all good. And if anybody's got an issue or anybody's running late, those are the ones that we want to focus on and, and help help them get going, help solve whatever problems they have, or understand what what the issues are going to be if they run late. And so the data is is really huge, and the being able to search through that data when you have the the kind of situation I talked about earlier where you've got that emergent uh, or urgent production issue that needs to be resolved. If you've got a lot of activities going on, you need to be able to find it. You know, so it's finding a needle in a haystack, but with the data, it makes it a little easier. So some of the trends that you can see will, will help you improve. So you can see who's, whose deployments are longer than most, who's starting on time, who's most often estimating well. So, you know, Helen, you were talking about rubber stamping before, right? part of your deployment plan is how much time do you need? And and things have to be stacked up. It's dominoes, right? When you're doing all these things stacked up really tightly in a, in a you know, short window. So you need to be able to know because I depend on the other guy. And, and if I don't start right, then I go late. And if I go late, then the next guy goes late. And then the whole thing falls apart. So we use that data to learn from, hey, last time, how were you? You know, you, you said you needed an hour. Did you take an hour? Did you take more? Did you take less? It's not good or bad. It's just better planning, right? So mm -hmm. if the better we get at planning, the more <clears> likely we are to be on, on track and keep our schedules moving smoothly. Because as you can imagine, if you've got manual deployments or if you need people to do any kind of validations or, or, or anything, you need to be timely and you want to not, not impact the business. If you don't know when things are going to happen, then it's chaos and it's you know impossible to keep it going. And then you run the risk of, of having trouble and causing problems in production. And I think you were just touching on this and we've, we've kind of hit it a few times already, but I think it's really important to bring this out strongly for the audience that having access to this data and being able to see into in particular the dependencies and the risks makes the release manager's role different. Your day-to-day -day work is different because yeah. you're able to pinpoint things really fast and zero in. A hundred percent. I mean, this is an example of a dashboard that, that, that we built. And, and by the way, the, the Tableau is so simple. I mean, I had an intern build this dashboard um, a couple of years ago. Um, so it was real easy to put together, um, but it gives a, a quick uh, snapshot of where things are. The one that's highlighted there with the, bo the box around it, 
the one in red is the one that has an issue. So I don't care about all the ones that are green and, and are completed. I care about the one that's that's got an issue, and then I can go look at it and I can work on it and help help them. Um, and uh, the visibility is it's the only way you can with so many things going on. Uh, I've got four release managers managing 80 applications, and they're each working on their own thing. And and each individual team is updating mm -hmm. their own plans. So we've got lots of people updating this stuff. So the the feedback is pretty close to real time to be able to see what's going on. And you can identify an issue pretty fast. So you don't have to wait for somebody to, to say, hey, I'm waiting for this other release to finish. You know it. You know the issue. Um, so you're saying you don't need a, a, a big phone call where you get everybody on the phone? No, not so. I mean, we have little phone calls because sometimes you do need phone calls for the individual things to, to get <clears throat> that people are working on. But you don't need a big phone call with, you know, 100 people working on it. Um, Helen, I see a comment in the chat that that I can address if you would like. Yeah, go so for it. Yeah, it's data, right? So the answer to that question is having. Oh, data. Well, let's read Vincent's question out first, if that's okay. So Vincent has asked: as release size increases, it gets hard to differentiate between a large release and a risky release. I'm kind of worried for Vincent first of all that his releases are getting bigger. <laughs> that's the opposite of what we should be trying to do, but we'll just go with that. That's happening. Um, can you please provide an idea of a simple technique to manage the complex environment? Go for it, Tony. Sure. I mean, and from one perspective, Helen, bit bigger can be better because it means you're delivering more, right? But but that that's a kind of a different a different angle on it. But um, some of it is just being able to see what bigger means. So, uh, you know, how do you quantify bigger? Mm -hmm. So, you know, my answer to that is, I'm able to now with the data that I have, I'm able to tell the difference between somebody that's delivering two stories and somebody that's delivering a thousand stories or hundreds of stories. And so while that's not a hundred percent a black and white answer, it does tell you something when you can see that the more work that's going into a release, you can see the complexity going up and with complexity is always going to come more risk. So one of the other data points that, that I have that I've presented recently at, at a, a leadership a planning meeting is as the number of, features that get delivered. So forget about stories for a second. If you roll those up to features, because that's where the functionality is being delivered. The more features that are delivered by a team, the higher their incident counts are, right? So it, it what that means is that as your releases are getting more complex, your risk of an issue is getting more complex. So those guys now are the ones to look at. Oh, you're delivering a lot of features in this release. Maybe I need to look a little closer. Maybe we need to peel back the onion on our testing or our planning or whatever it is. But it it helps you separate the little guys or the guys that are delivering you know, maybe one one thing versus the guys that are delivering a lot of things and helps you focus on the ones that kind of need attention. And Vincent, mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered that question 100 percent, but I can tell you with a lot of certainty from my side, the more data that I have, the easier it is for me to identify the ones that I need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. feels like you're looking for the risks within a release rather than whether a release itself is risky. Is that a fair differentiation? Yeah, I, I'm looking for the ones that have potential. So, and, and I do that a couple of ways. One, one is I look at the size of what's being delivered. The other thing, um, by all seriousness, is I can look at their track record. I look at the track record of the teams delivering and, and how many issues they tend to cause when they deliver. And I can also you know, managed by exception that way. And I know that, you know, team A has a higher degree of incidence and okay, maybe we need to look at some things there. And Vincent, you know, again, I'm a, I'm a vendor. We can help you with that. Um, we can help you not only get the data, but have dashboards that po point you right to, you know, uh, a large release and risky release versus the others. Yeah. And one other thing I'll add to that is what I, I used to have a scenario where, I would find out on the last day, you know, before the release that somebody was running out of time and weren't really going to make it mm -hmm. because I really couldn't tell the size of their release. But the more data I have now, now I can see literally I can see three weeks in advance of the release out of the 80 guys that are in the release. I can see the six that are at risk and then I can mm -hmm. start working with them. And that doesn't completely make the risk go away, but it it makes my life a lot better and it may, it's a lot less stressful for me because I know that those guys are going to be having trouble at the end. I don't have to wait till three weeks from now to find out. And then all of a sudden we're running around in a fire drill trying to figure it out. We have three weeks to try to figure it out. And then if we don't make it, we can make an informed decision just to pull them from the release. 
Fabulous. And you've given Vincent a light bulb moment. So that's very exciting <laughs> as well. Our job here is done. Webinar over. <laughs> Just joking. We've got a little way to go yet. Um, I'm going to kick off the next poll. I'll start it off and then I want to just step back actually and go back to automated auditability. We probably won't go back to the slide, but I want to talk about the behavioural change. So we've talked a lot about what the release manager is doing, but I also want to talk about how the release manager encourages the teams to do things like continuous checking. But before we go there, let me kick this poll off. This poll is asking, do you have governance around your release and deployment process? And your answers are... Uh, a, no, I wish we did. B, no, and we don't need it. C, yes, and we make continuous compliance checks. D, we have automated our audit. So what I've seen in the companies I've worked with, um, Tony, is checklists, so often spreadsheet-based checklists where people go through them. And then there seems to be a, a period of transition where people automate those checklists. And they often automate them into the CICD pipeline and into various tools. And we end up in a place where now people don't have to spend two weeks a year manually grabbing data and reports because they've got continuous compliance and they've got automated auditability. So when the auditors come in, you can point them at the data. And it's a beautiful thing. Are you experiencing that happening in your environment? Yeah, we have a little bit of both. We, we do have the the concept of a checklist, but it's it's somewhat automated where it's uh, it's created for every release in a systematic way, and and then we can um, we we track them within a tool rather than tracking them in a spreadsheet, and we have a different level of of governance, if you will, for things that are automated and things that are not. So you might have thirty things that are on your checklist for most applications. And then the automated applications have a handful because there's just a couple checks that you wanna do that, that, that can't be automated, a couple sanity checks that you need to do or that you want to do. Um, so yeah, absolutely. It, the more automation, the better, um, but it also gives you consistency in your process and lets you decide which ones need the rigor and which ones don't. So anything that's manual is gonna need, always gonna need more rigor than anything that's automated. I'm going to close that poll and some very good news from the audience today. We've got 36% our biggest group saying, yes, we make continuous compliance checks. Um, only 9% that have automated audits. So that's their kind of next level. And um, we do have 32% that say no and they wish they did. And interestingly, 23% that say no and we don't need it. Jeff, no, and we don't need it. What's going on there? <laughs> well, I, I'm sure that question has been posed to Tony, um, hey, we're fine. Um, we don't need any of that compliance and audit stuff. We're okay, right? It, don't you get that question all the time from teams? Trust but verify. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, and, and that's kind of the point is um, you need something in place to kind of help out. Uh, you, you, yeah, you do. You want to know if at least, you know, we're, 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 we're being consistent. Absolutely. So what do we do if we want perfectly orchestrated complex deployments, Jeff? Well, you're going to need it. I mean, ideally, we love to wave a magic wand and all teams have no dependencies, are 100% automated, and any deployment they do are completely perfect, won't interrupt any uh, business functionality and everything's great. Uh, in order to get to that utopia, um, good luck. Probably not going to happen for a while. And even if you do, you're still going to have a, uh, uh, you know, if you're part of an enterprise, someone's going to say, well, prove it and show me that you haven't messed anything up. And, and you know, in, in getting that journey, you're going to have some missteps along the way regardless. But to pull this all off, you have to have some kind of tool that's going to mix together the automated and the manual activities. Orchestration is that tool that is the glue that combines it together. Um, and, and it helps you on this journey because you don't have to get all the way there. You can do it in steps. Um, while you're running your orchestration, you can look at the longest running steps and uh, automate them and then plug it in and work it together. The key is though, that don't play Russian roulette with this. Um, even if it's automated, even, or if it's manual, you don't want to be stomping on something else. Like I, I mentioned, I had a, a customer who said, 
that, you know, their deployments were, and I'll quote, like playing Russian roulette. You didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> and you don't want to do that. You don't want to play dice with this, um, with this event. Um, you know, the, the best written code doesn't need to uh, have egg on their face because the deployment stomped on somebody else who was trying to do, uh, you know, conflicting actions at the same time. So that's where these uh, perfectly orchestrated complex deployments come together. Perfect. So do you want to take us home in our last 10 minutes, of course, leaving Charlene her all important little bit at the end? You bet. You know, I, I, it, for the folks that were on the poll saying, I wish we had governance around our release and deployment processes, I can't tell you how easy this is. It's just take your spreadsheets, upload them, we'll help you manage it. We're, we're a tool that is part of a broader value stream management platform that manages the deployment process. And you've seen a lot of the bits. We pull that data in, we give you visibility into it, we allow you to set the, the templatized processes, we manage the, appro the approvals, we give you groups and sets and ways to slice and dice the data and um, uh, basically, um, uh, help you in the in the managing of the process so that you can be as transparent as possible and yet still ensure the right things happen and allow teams, in essence, to drive their own car, if you will, to, uh, uh, to get it to the finish line, but yet still add some guardrails around so that they're not going to conflict with others. And they can automate as much as they want. And you still will stand at the head with all this data to help guide their improvement process, integrating with all their existing tools. The best part about this is that you can then manage by exception and not have to uh, uh, deal with the day-to-day, -day, if you will. Um, eliminate the mass of communication that you're doing manually, or here's the latest version of the spreadsheet and hope you got the latest one when it comes time for go live. Um, and, and that's really the point. Um, once you have all this, you get to the sexiest part, frankly, um, which are the analytics. I think that's actually on the next slide. Yeah, sorry. I um, wasn't sure if I was doing what you were doing up there. No, <laughs> it's just fine. Um, uh, the analytics is, is really the data that gives you the visualization. Um, you know, are you doing better? Uh, what's, you know, has this helped you improve the flow? Um, what trends are you seeing? Uh, Tony mentioned a few of them, things like, uh, you know, the, the, the late, the late comers and the impact that they're having to the deployments or they're not ready. And what's the impact, what your ability to have agility when someone comes and says, Hey, I need to make a last minute change. Uh, is that okay? Or, or I've got an outage and I've got to deal with it. So everything else needs to slide or heaven forbid, there's some tragedy or, or other issue where everything needs to halt. And what happens? How do you actually stop a release when you're midway? What will happen? Uh, you know, the, the data and the analytics gives you agility, helps you uh, be able to react and, and do things that you couldn't do before. And well, I, I'm, I'd love to hear, you know, uh, maybe back on that last one, Tony, how has the data helped you? You know, what, what have the analytics done for you? Um, I mean, it, you know, it's done a lot. It's, it's helped, it's helped me know, um, you know, first of all, it's helped my sanity, right? Because I know during, <laughs> during a, a long release, I, I'm not keeping my fingers crossed, hoping everything's going to be okay. I'm not wondering what's going on. I know what's going on. I know exactly what's going on. And I know before everybody else does that something's going bad. So I can, you know, I can kind of talk to the right people and either try to get it on track or set the right expectations. So people know that the, the, you know, the message is coming. It's helped me get teams to plan better. Tell me, find, find the ones that are causing the delays in the release, find the ones that are causing the production issues. I, I can tell you, I won't quote numbers, but I can tell you, I know what our, what our rate of incidents are going into a release. And I know what our rate of incidents are when we have scope creep. And I know mm -hmm. what our rate of incidents are when things come late into the release. And I do, I can do that from data, but that helps me, make decisions and get a lot of support from people for having a more rigorous process because, well, well, why can't I come into the release? Well, my history shows that we're going to double our risk of incidents by you coming in at, at this point in the life cycle, it's too late. You know, our risk is too high. And, and on the deployment side, it, you know, it helps me highlight where the problems are, which, wh where we can fine tune things, 
you know, which teams aren't planning well. So then maybe they say they need an hour, but they usually need two. We can historically look at that. And sometimes we'll go back and say, hey, Jeff, I know you said you need an hour, but usually you need two. Why don't we plan for two? Mm -hmm. um, this way, something else doesn't slide at the other end. So it's um, that that is hugely valuable. And then you Love use it. to get better. And we use I, to get better. I, I And that just that's the right answer. You know, that's really where it ought to be. Hey, look, how does value stream management fit into this? Well, this is just a spotlight into one area of value stream management. Value stream management is concept basically just takes data across the, the tool chains, if you will, and brings them into a common data model where you can uh, do stuff with them. In this specific case, we're talking about the deployment activities, the go live events and what it takes to cut over and, and coordinating and organizing that in such a way. Value stream management as a, as a methodology is all about smoothing out the flow and making it more efficient by being able to visualize that and model the processes themselves. And that's what you're, we've been talking about here is modeling the process of deployment. But all that data flows into uh, a data warehouse that you get uh, out of box dashboards and the ability to use enterprise analytics engines against and get the insights that you need to manage by exception and get pointed to the right area. Platora is a vendor that's a leader in the value stream management space. So we've got a cloud-based platform. This is what we do. Um, it's pretty simple. You just hook it up and go. Um, and uh, that's that's why we're here. Don't don't sit there and struggle. Get out of these long uh, weekend meetings where you know you're starting the conference call at six in the morning, and some teams are really happy because they're completely automated, and some teams are really struggling because they ain't. Um, and and provide visibility to what's going on. Good. So, Charlene, oh, skip slide. There we go. Charlene, I think we're over to you. All right, all right. Well, you can see on the screen right now there is a download for the uh, complimentary ebook, The Evolution of the Release Manager. So, uh, go ahead and click on that download now button if you are interested in getting a copy for yourself. Uh, but I do want to thank everybody who did submit questions throughout the uh, the webinar. And if we didn't get to uh, your question, I do apologize, but please know that the folks at Plutora are going to get a copy of all the questions that came in. So I'm sure they'll be more than happy to follow up with you offline to get your question answered. Uh, also, a quick reminder that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the event, or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have that opportunity. Uh, after today's webinar, we are going to be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to devops.com slash webinars and look in the on demand section it should be right there waiting for you. All right, before we close things out, let's do the drawing for the $425 Amazon gift cards. Our first winner today is Emily, Emily B. Congratulations, Emily. Our second winner today is Aruna B. Congratulations, Aruna. Our third winner is Alan J. Congratulations, Alan. And our fourth and final winner today is Vincent A. Congratulations, Vincent. Congratulations to all four of you. We'll be reaching out to you via email to get your Amazon gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. And if you don't see anything there, please check your spam folder. All right, guys, Jeff, Helen, Tony, thank you all so much for a great presentation. As always, lots of great takeaways in today's presentation. So thanks again for your time and for your expertise. Really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank and you. special yeah. thanks to Tony. You know, I, man, you've been in the trenches. You've done it. I, it's just awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody. And please, whatever you do, stay safe.